hear me? Sounds, uh, sounds pretty loud up here. Can you hear me out there? Okay, good, good, good. Well, if you're wondering uh, if you're in the right place, if you're looking for SALT, seven areas of life training, that's not in here. That's not happening tonight. It's not happening until next month, okay? It'll happen in this room on the Wednesday nights in May, but for the rest of the Wednesday nights in April in this room, we're going to be uh, working our way through some materials called What in the World is a Nazarene? This, is part, this uh, church is known as uh, formally, here's its formal full name, okay? My full name, Clifford Lee Purcell. Um, Guys my age who grew up in the part of the country that I did, there's probably, oh, you know, like 30% of the guys, their middle name is Lee. And it, one way or another, they were named after General Lee, okay? Because of the part of the country that I was in. Um, uh, where was I going with that? Full name of the church. Full name of the church is Grandview First Church of the Nazarene. Now, I mentioned on Sunday that we turned 100 years old this year. Apparently, when they started this church, somebody thought there may be two or three Nazarene churches in town by the time we're done with it. And so they said, we're First Church of the Nazarene. You'll find lots of little towns all over America that have First Church of the Nazarene, like you'll find First Baptist Church or whatever, okay? Uh, we're, we're a church of the Nazarene, and we're going to learn over the course of the next three weeks what that really means. And uh, you may have had friends who ask you where, to, where you go to church, and, and you've said, oh, we're over at Grandview Nazarene. And they may just nod, or they may say, well, what do the Nazarenes believe? Or who are the Nazarenes? And you get this <laughs> moment when you're like, uh, my friends go there, uh, they believe the Bible, uh, Jesus, right? I mean, but how do you really answer that question? I want to give you some handles on how to answer that question, not only for other people who are asking, but so that you can know the church that you're a part of. You can know it kind of from, from frontwards to backwards, from, from stem to stern. And then it'll help you do a couple of things. It'll help you uh, decide if this really is your church. And uh, just so you know, I'm not trying to get uh, people to leave, all right? <laughs> not trying to get people to leave. But I also think it's very important that you attend a church that you, you believe what it's teaching, Right, and uh, and so if you if along the way you say, oh, I'm not sure that I believe some of that stuff. Um, I'm not going to ask you to uh, make your way quickly to the exit or anything like that. Because here's what I have found: I found that I can learn and grow and change my mind about some things. I've also found that um, if uh, don't tell Laura, but she's not here this evening. I don't agree with her about everything, but I have found that um, I. We agree about enough things, that the things where we disagree, they just don't matter as much as the things where we do agree, and so we're able to do life together. And I think that's possible uh, in a church as well. So I want you to, uh, as, as I answer these questions, what, you know, the question, what in the world is a Nazarene over the course of the next three weeks, I want you to find out how well your, your church fits you. Let me put, the, put this another way. I'm a cheapskate. Okay? I like nice things. I just don't like to pay what you have to pay for most nice things. So I end up being a bargain, being a means that I almost never pay full price for clothing or shoes. Hunting boots, I will pay the big dollars. But for most things, I will, I will just, I won't. So a lot of times I'll go to, you know, Ross or TJ Maxx or one of those places to buy a shirt. And a lot of the shirts there are, you know, they're factory seconds. You know what I mean? Like the sleeves sewn on just a little bit crooked so the, the uh, two times a day I just kind of have to like straighten the sleeve back out or I just do one of these because it just doesn't quite fit perfectly but, you know it's close enough for me to go yeah it's a decent shirt and it, and it's worth the worth the money so I'll buy it um, I think that most churches I think that virtually every church for virtually every person is a factory second meaning this it doesn't fit you perfectly it's not tailor-made uh, around you and so you'll find some places where, you know, maybe it fits through the shoulders, but the sleeves are a little bit short. Maybe it, it fits in the sleeves, but uh, the buttons are stretched a little tight. Or maybe, you know what I'm saying? Um, most, most churches, people have to make some sort of accommodation to say, yeah, that's my church. Because if you find a church that fits you perfectly, you find a church where you believe absolutely everything 
it's probably a cult that you started. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If, if the, the church that fits Cliff per- perfectly is the church of Cliff, and you should not join it, okay? So uh, I want to help you understand your, your church and how well it fits you. And if you find that it fits pretty well, then, then I want you to ask yourself a question, because I'm not going to ask, I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not a pressure kind of guy, but I want you to ask yourself a question. If you think the church fits you pretty well, would you then consider the possibility of, be, of becoming a member, of officially joining the church? Um, uh, there's no, uh, we don't give away like prizes for that. Um, there's no dividends at the end of the year where you get paid, you know, none of, none of that stuff. Uh, but here's what being a member of, of the church um, can, can do for the church and for you. Uh, the church has, is, is an organism. It's a living thing, but it's also an organization, okay? And uh, you, you can guess that in a building this size with as many people as attend here on Sundays and all the different ministries that we've got going on and being part of a larger denomination, oh, yeah, and we're also a 501c3 nonprofit corporation registered under uh, you know, United States uh, tax code and registered with the state of Washington. It takes a bit to run the organization, you know what I mean? And organizations need a handful of things. They need people who will help make the organization run, and they need people who will lead within the organization as well. And so membership is, uh, is a way that we say to one another, you know what, I'm in. I'm in to help, and I'm in to help lead if the rest of the church maybe um, views me as a leader, okay? It's not promising that you're, that you're going to sit on a board or that you're going to teach a class, but it's saying I'm in at the level that I'll consider whatever is asked of me by the rest of the congregation. I'll help make the organization go that helps the ministry to happen. And so I just ask you as we get to the end of these next, uh, these next three lessons as we're answering the question, you know, who is, who is Grandview Nazarene? What in the world's a Nazarene? And you find that it fits you pretty well. Would you and God have a conversation about membership? And whatever it is that you decide about that, you can let us know. And you'll never hear another peep from me about it. I'm not going to pull you aside and corner you on the thing because I think that's something for you all to decide. Okay? So I'm going to try to answer the question, as I mentioned on Sunday. If, uh, if somebody says, what in the world is a Nazarene? I think they may be asking, hey, where'd you guys come from? And so tonight we're going to learn about our history. They may be asking, what is it that your church believes compared to the Lutherans or, or the Mormons or the Catholics or the Baptists? And uh, I'll answer uh, that question next week. And then the following week, I'm going to answer the, the other implied question when folks say, well, in the world's a Nazarene. I mean, they know we're some kind of a church. They know we're, we're kind of religious. But they're asking, how do you guys live? Are there a bunch of rules? What do you guys do that are different than the, than the whoever's? And so we'll talk a little bit about kind of the collective conscience of the church and how Nazarenes, uh, generally speaking, live together and as a presence in the world around us. And so those are, those are the three things that we're going to talk about over the course of the next three weeks. Let's pray tonight, and then we'll kind of we'll jump in, all right? Lord, I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of your church, and, and I'm also thankful to be a part of the Nazarene part of it. But I also know that if the Nazarene part were to dry up and blow away tomorrow, I'd still be a part of your church Jesus and some other group somewhere in the world would say, come on in, Cliff, and, and they'd let me worship with them, and they'd uh, watch me over time and, and see if they could trust me enough to let me serve in some other ways. I'm grateful to be a part of your church, Jesus. You welcomed us in. You forgave us of our sins. You, uh, you gave us new life on this side and the promise of, of eternal life on the other. I'm just, I can't believe all the good things that you have, have promised us and, and have done for us. We're going to apply ourselves to, uh, to trying to learn about the beauty of your church, Lord, so you might get some more glory, and we might fall in love a little bit deeper with the church. And then, Lord, I, I want to talk to you about Grandview Church of the Nazarene, because, I mean, that's, that's the church for us. This, it's the place where we experience what it is to be a part of your church and a part of your mission in this world. 
And I love Grandview Church of the Nazarene. And I want to ask you to make this church what you dreamed it would be when you dreamed it into existence 100 years ago. I don't think you're done with this. I think you're just getting us revved up and ready to launch into this next century. And so I ask, Lord, that you just do it. You just get everything out of this church that you want to get out of it. All the good that you can work into it, we'll work it into the world. Help us now as we turn our attention to uh, the study of where we came from and uh, help us to see how we're connected to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, um, I'm gonna, there's, there's a bunch of, um, I'd say, introductory stuff in this, uh, in this handout that you've got, and I've kind of covered mm, mostly this, this first page, the, the welcome page, that has those three little, uh, little pictures in it, other than to say this other thing about membership. Um, three things that I want you to know. First, no pressure, I kind of covered that. Second, if you do make a decision to join Grandview Church of the Nazarene, you're not joining a denomination, you're joining this local church. And that, uh, that membership, if you would like, could stay here your whole life. Or if you move somewhere else and you want to join a, a Nazarene church somewhere else, you can transfer that membership and it would be recognized by that other church. But you're not joining a great big denomination. You join the people whose names you know. The people that you worship with. That's who you'd be making a commitment to if you were to join the church. And then uh, thirdly, I would just say this. No second-class citizens, okay? For, um, we're, there's, not, there's not two groups of people here, members and not members. That's not the way that we live. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That member's far more than whose name gets written on a page somewhere. If our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then we're brothers and sisters in Jesus, right? So, uh, enough of that. Um, I want to just tonight spend our time on this page. There's not a bunch of reading for you to do. You can go back and read that other stuff. I just want to camp out on this page right here. It's a timeline because as we're uh, tonight trying to answer the question of where we came from, what's the, what's the story of the, the Church of the Nazarene, here's what I'm going to try to do. Whew, the year is 2021. I'm going to try to get us, I'm going to try to tell the story from 4 BC to 2021 in about 45 minutes. <laughs> Good luck, Cliff. But I'm going to try to tell the whole story of church history, and here's why. The church of the Nazarene did not drop out of, sky, out of the sky from God. It did not drop out of heaven as this, this one thing that he was doing on the earth. There is a religious group in the American West that believes they have nothing to do with the church historically, but that God dropped their religion right out of heaven, perfect, and said, there, now, now you have this perfect religion. That's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, okay? The folks that you, you know of as, as Mormons. They believe that just, you know, 150-ish years ago, God literally just said, here's the religion from heaven. We don't believe that. We believe that we have an imperfect religion. We believe that it has been messed up by humans time and time again and purified by God time and time again, working all its way all the way back through history. So instead of seeing ourselves as separate from the other churches, the other denominations, we see ourselves as part of this big stream of what God has been doing down through history and the, the ways that the church has messed up the mission of God, we, we, we share some of the culpability for that. And the ways that God has, uh, that the church has honored God's name and, um, and put a good face on him toward the public, we get a share in that as well. But we are part and parcel of the one true church. We're not the one true church. We are part of the one true church of Jesus Christ, which began with Jesus himself. So we're going to turn the clock back, all the way back to, uh, you're familiar that history and the way that we mark time kind of falls into two halves, B.C., before Christ, A.D. Uh, is um, uh, a, a Latin term, anno domini, which means in the year of our Lord. So the, the, the folks who are arranging time, the, the way that it has come to us, said before Jesus, whew, the world was one thing. And as soon as he showed up on the planet, all of time from there on out belongs to him. In the year of our Lord, 2021. Okay? We're going to roll it all the way back, not to zero, 
not to the year uh, zero, which would seem to be the year that Jesus was born. We didn't mark time very well. We've lost track of it a couple of times. We've, we've changed the way the months are arranged and all of that. So that scholars tell us that the best that we can tell is that Jesus was probably born uh, in, in what you and I would call 4 to 6 B.C. So Jesus was born before Christ, right? It doesn't work out very well uh, on a calendar, but that's where we're rolling time back to to say the year that Jesus was born was about, I'd say right about 4 B.C., and then, by the way that we, uh, under, we read the New Testament and, and kind of count the years there, it seems that Jesus lived to be about 33 years old. We don't know exactly, but right about 33 years. And so if we say Jesus was crucified when he was 33, then four minus 4 plus 33 takes us to the year 29. So you'll see that first green dot on the page. It says 4 B.C. to 29 A.D. And that little picture that you have out there on the side, that's one of the earliest known depictions of Jesus. That's actually a first century painting of him, and it shows him. It's so little you can't, you can't probably hardly make it out, but it shows him with, uh, with a sheep on his shoulders and uh, some others around him, and it's, it's that reference, uh, uh, oh, that we talked about on Easter, right, where he said, I'm the door of the sheep. Yeah, Jesus as the great shepherd. And so the church of Jesus Christ has its start in Jesus himself. That's why we call it the Church of Jesus Christ, all right? We're going to talk about why we call this place the Church of the Nazarene instead of the Church of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that later in the hour, but know this. There's this whole Old Testament, and all of the Old Testament of your Bible, interesting as it is, having some incredible standalone kind of God moments that in and of themselves seem to have great and abiding value, They really are all leading up to Jesus coming into this world. And so um, the folks who are writing the Old Testament as they went along, they weren't all real aware of that. But the New Testament writers, also working under the inspiration of the Spirit, helped us understand what God was doing down through time. And so it gives us the benefit, because of where we were born in history, to look back at that Old Testament and say, <clears throat> anything that you read in that Old Testament, don't take it as a standalone story. It may seem to have value, making some great point because of where it, you know, just how, how powerful the, the, the characters are or the lessons are. But all of that Old Testament was just doing this, just pointing to the future and pointing specifically to when Jesus would come and be the perfect revelation of God the Father. You want to know what God's like? Just read what Jesus is like. He's the perfect expression of the Father. So all that Old Testament stuff pointing to 4 B.C. on our calendar, 4 B.C., when Jesus would come into this world and then live his life and then die on the cross, as we talked about, be resurrected from the dead, appear to the saints, those earliest followers of his, for 40 days, then test them for 10 days while they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then he gave the Holy Spirit. And the the coming of the Holy Spirit right there in in the year 29 uh, AD is what we count as the birth of the church. Okay. So if you had talked to the disciples of Jesus while he was with them, and you asked them, um, are you a Christian? They would have said, what's that? They'd never heard the word. And if you had asked them, well, where do you go to church? They would have said, what's that? They'd never heard the word. They were Jewish people. <clears throat> okay. they, pract- they, were, they were Israeli people who practiced a religion known as Judaism. Jesus was an Israeli person who practiced Judaism. But he called his followers to understand life, I mean, just significantly differently. And they remained practicing Judaism for a while, but they were modifying their Judaism in light of what Jesus had taught them to where there there came a point where the Christians no longer said, we're Jews who follow Jesus. They just said, we are the followers of Jesus. Now, there are still some people in this world today who say we are Jews who follow Jesus. We typically refer to them as Messianic Jews. So if you come across that title, Messianic Jews, these are people who say we still practice the religion of Judaism, 
but we understand all of it in light of Jesus and his teachings. And so they're, they're an interesting group of people. They are our brothers and sisters, okay? But the birthday of the church of Jesus Christ was when the Holy Spirit w- uh, was given to them on the day of Pentecost. They burst out into the streets, and they start proclaiming the gospel in the, all the known languages of the people there. And on that first day, 3,000 people, bam, they go from 120 in the upper room to 3,120 by the end of the day. And the church was off and running. You can imagine If you said, hey, I'm going to start a small business, and the small business is going to be me and my spouse, and maybe maybe we'll have one of the kids helping, and uh, by the end of the week, it was 320 employees, you would be running for your life. You'd think, I'm going to get no sleep. I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to get the product in. I don't know how to get the product out. I don't, I don't have a place to store all this stuff. I don't, scheduling, who had time to sit down and schedule all of the employees? That's the problem that the original church had on its very first day in existence. It went from 120 people who'd been used to just taking their cues from Jesus, who seemed to be arranging pretty much everything, to now there's 3,120 of them, and they're looking at guys who had never considered themselves leaders. They consider themselves followers, the original apostles. They're looking at them saying, um, what, 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 are you, what are we doing tomorrow? Well, I really hadn't thought about it. And so these folks were, were um, you're going to read in the book of Acts that we're studying on Sunday mornings. They're doing their best. But when you read the book of Acts, you should know this, the earliest days of the church. Um, I'm going to give you two words I want you to hang on to. Prescriptive and descriptive, okay? Prescriptive, if you read something that's prescriptive, it's telling you this is what you need to do. So your doctor gives you a prescription, right? You need to take these pills. It's the right thing for you to do to take these pills. These pills are going to make you healthy. Something that's descriptive isn't telling you what should be, it's telling you what is. And in the book of Acts, we have to scratch our heads pretty often to say, is that prescriptive or descriptive? And just so you know, the text isn't always clear. When Jesus said, thou shalt, that's prescriptive. He's telling you this is what you need to do. When we read about these these disciples of Jesus, and it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When, When they speak filled with the Holy Spirit, we have this sense of, okay, that's prescriptive. But remember how we were talking Sunday how they said, uh, you know, we should, we, should, uh, we should pick a new disciple. Yeah, God help us, help us to draw straws. That was probably not prescriptive. That's probably just a description of what was taking place. So you're going to see in the early church, they did some things that worked. They did some things that didn't work. They did some things that seemed to work at the time. And then later on, they looked back and went, oh, that might have been a mistake. Um, the early church, here's what I'm trying to tell you. It was filled with people like you and me. You can can believe in Jesus. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you can still be imperfect. And that means that you all sometimes have some imperfect judgment because you, you can't see all things like God can, and you don't have all of time and history to be able to consider when you make your decisions, when you're pressed to make a decision, or when you jump to make a decision, right? You can be filled, you can believe in Jesus, you can be filled with his Holy Spirit living in you, and you can still be an imperfect person. I got news for you. All of you are, and your pastors. All of you, just imperfect, okay? We're not going to get church exactly right around here, but that's okay. We're going to learn about church history, and you'll see there's a lot of times they didn't get it right. And still God's Holy Spirit says, I'm in there with them. And Jesus is still saying, that's my people, and I'm proud of them. And the, the, the Heavenly Father is saying, yep, those are my children. One day I'm going to gather them all to myself. Birthday of the church was uh, there in 29 AD, and they were off and running. And... Um, what an incredible start they got as, uh, as they took off. And so let me just kind of connect you with the New Testament. Then we've got the Gospels, those four different versions of the, the life story of Jesus told by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? We studied all Mark together the first six months or so that, that I was with you. Then we get to the book of Acts, and Jesus is no longer the, the central character. He's, he's sent his Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is empowering the church to what? Still make Jesus the star of the show. 
I mean, they're just going around telling the Jesus story and the Holy Spirit story. And so there, in those beginning days of the church, those first several years, we have the book of Acts that describes the earliest time of the church. But just so you know, there were some other books written by Christians at the time. And that, the, the, the other books that were written got circulated around the, uh, the church in the Mediterranean world and down into northern Africa and then farther over into Asia. And some of those books they made copies of, and uh, they, they became um, kind of a, a real guide for the earliest Christians because they were written by people who knew Jesus personally. And many of those books we have gathered into what we, we call the New Testament of the Bible. But those were not the only books that were written at the time to help describe Christian faith, to help describe Jesus, to help describe what religious life might look like when you're following him. And the the church possesses many, many, many other works that were written during that period. But some of them we look at and we go, man, it's full of error. Some of it we look at and we say, uh, sorry, but that wasn't written by Peter, even though the, though the guy who signed it said, seriously, I'm the Apostle Peter, because we can look at it and say, mm, we know by the style of writing that this was not written by a guy who, who lived in Galilee because of his vocabulary and those kinds of things. So there were all kinds of, of books that were circulating in the first and second and, and the third century that the church has really had to wade through, and we'll talk about how they did that in just a moment. But that they really had to wade through and say, which ones are authentic to what Jesus really was teaching? And it was a long, elaborate process where the church, um, uh, let, let's just say there were some arguments along the way. But the church ended up, after all of the arguments, unanimous that those books that are included in our New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, these things were, they, they, they have apostolic authority. The apostles of Jesus are linked to these books, okay? But there are also some other books that we have found to be valuable. One of them is a book called the Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, Didache. It's probably worth reading at some time in your life uh, as a follower of Jesus, the Didache, um, it was, to, uh, Didache means uh, to teach or the teacher. And so this was, we don't know who the author was, but we have found that many of the early church fathers were mentioning this book. And we actually have a, a pretty good piece of it. And so you can, you can look up the, the Didache on Google if you'd like, and you'll read some other stuff. We don't give it the authority of Scripture because we can't connect it for sure to one of the apostles, but the Didache was, it was definitely uh, an early formative book um, in the first century. There's some other writings that you may have heard about. Anybody hear about uh, Dan Brown's book? Um, oh, what was, come on, what was the name of that novel? The Da Vinci Code? Yeah, Da Vinci Code painted the picture that the whole Bible's false, that this, this is just a conspiracy by a bunch of people who wanted to, to control uh, world wealth and world power. Listen, I got to tell you, the disciples weren't smart enough people. But really, the followers, of the first followers of Jesus, they weren't smart enough and they weren't well-connected enough to pull that off. They just weren't. Most of them were illiterate, Okay. Um, those conspiracy kind of things that the church was pushing out and, and hiding some of the truths about Jesus, that he wasn't really who he said he was. We have found those writings to be spurious and untrustworthy. They just don't hold up under scholarship, okay? So you'll still see some things like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. You'll find some other, other things like that. They're often referred to as uh, these are great big words um, that you don't really need to remember, but apocrypha and pseudepigrapha, okay? Pseudo, pseudo means fake, right? Pseudopigraphic writings are, are typically writings where somebody signed it with the name of somebody important. Uh, seriously, this is Peter writing this, wink, wink, nod, nod. This is the Apostle John's writings, and we know because we have some other of John's writings that they weren't. So we, we had a bunch of, of um, religious charlatans who were actually trying to lead some folks astray. 
But in that first period, uh, within the first century, we started seeing uh, not only was the church born and taking off, but then the church started getting persecuted by uh, individuals and then official state persecution by some of the governments around there, the Israeli government, the Roman uh, Empire government. And because of those persecutions, the church that was at first just huddled together there in Jerusalem it starts getting scattered around the world because they were arresting people and killing them, okay? And uh, lots of people will say, I can be a Christian somewhere else. And so out of Rome or out of Jerusalem, they went. And they went, interestingly, all over the known world of the day. And guess what happened? The people who'd been trying to stamp out the church of Jesus Christ, they just took a dandelion and went, there, I got rid of the dandelion. No, you didn't. You spread the seed all over the place. Now it's springing up and taking roots all over the known world. And the gospel and the church of Jesus Christ spread like wildfire. And because of that, now we've got 3,000 in Jerusalem that have been blown out all over the world. And everywhere they go, the same thing's happening that we read about in Acts. They're just, they're just bearing testimony to Jesus. And the church is growing in Africa. And the church is growing. Within the first century, we have pretty clear indication that the gospel had made it all the way over to the British Isles. Get this, um, Thomas, the doubting Thomas, one of the apostles, his grave is in India. That's a long way to walk, just so you know. That's a long way to walk from Jerusalem, but get this. We have other writings that indicate to us that he was, he'd come back to India. He'd been all the way to China. And we have one, one written account. It says that he actually made it as far as Japan with the gospel. So this, this church is like this, just popping up all over the world. And so this church that had been a, a movement of um, just this organic grassroots kind of thing where no local expression of it was, was typically bigger than could meet in a modest home, five, six, a dozen people maybe, um, they, they kind of knew where the other Christians were meeting, and there was this kind of loose network in each city and each town of, of who the Christians were, and they, they found a way to connect with one another and meet one another's needs and so forth. But as that thing grew and grew and multiplied all around the planet, they started saying, we're going to have to organize ourselves a little bit better for a number of reasons, so we can take care of one another, and secondly, so that we remain faithful to Jesus, and so that some of those false teachings that I was talking about didn't take root in the church. And so over the course of the, at the end of the first century into the second and third centuries, we find that the church is now starting to institutionalize. And one of the things that kind of like, it was kind of like a um, uh, developmental leap for the church is also harshly criticized. And there came a point in uh, right around the year 300 when they started saying, you know, um, we're going to have to build some buildings. The very first church buildings that were built for that purpose were built right around the year 300. And when they started building buildings, some good things happened. You could teach larger numbers of people, right? So we could make sure that the, the true gospel that was being preached would now be preached instead of to six people or ten people, it could be preached to five or six hundred people all at the same time. So as long as we had a good and faithful teacher, we're making sure that the true gospel is being taught. But some bad things happened. People said, yeah, we'll just meet in the large groups and not in the small ones. And it's in the small ones where accountability and encouragement and, and some of the, 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 the nit, nitty-gritty kind of helps that we need from one another, where life gets messy, institutions don't deal with that real well, but friends do. And so the church kind of started getting this institutional thing to it and losing a little bit of the grassroots kind of thing. And with anything that gets organized and institutionalized, now we've got power from above being exerted as authority coming down. I've been in eastern, central Washington long enough to see how most people feel about power from above being forced down upon them. You guys like it about as much as my friends in North Idaho did, as my friends in Montana did before that, right? Uh-uh. And so you can see that that started to create some mm -mm -mm tension and pressure in the church. 
So we get there to that second dot that's the, the first church buildings, and they, they're moving from being a, a church movement, was from, from this uh, church house, uh, house church movement to this institutionalized thing. Was it good or was it bad? The answer is yes. It was a little bit of each of those things. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we, we, when we saw the importance of teaching the true gospel, it meant that we had to weed out the things that weren't true. How do you determine that? Because by the time we get to the, to the third century, all of the people who knew Jesus firsthand have been dead for two centuries, right? I mean, 200 years ago, they were dead, <clears throat> right? So how do we know <clears throat> which ones of them are true? Which ones Jesus really said? And, uh, you know, the, the business of, of um, documenting and collecting materials was much more difficult back in the day because they didn't have printing presses and, and uh, libraries were few and far between and because illiteracy rates were so very high. Uh, and libraries didn't have, you know, like climate-controlled rooms to preserve old documents. And so... Uh, the church had a, a real struggle on its hands. So from the years 300 to 800, you'll see that the church put together a series of uh, big events that are referred to as the great councils of the church. And these great councils, they, they, they collected representatives from all over the known world. Anywhere there was a church, they said, send us your most mature and godly person because we need them to come and help us pray our way and think our way through this, all this writing and all of these teachings that are filtering back to us. People are saying all kinds of crazy things. And there have always been people who have tried to exploit religious people to make money and get power. So the great councils were saying, we've got to find the truth, and we also have to deal with the people who are not being truthful and who are trying to exploit us. Okay? So they said, send us your best. Send us your brightest, send us your holiest people. And so they would call these councils, and because travel was so very difficult and, and it was one spot in the world where they're, where they're meeting, many times it took these folks like up to two years to get to the meeting. Some of these meetings would last a year or two, sometimes more. And sometimes people died in the process. Some of those people never got back home. The church, uh, that it even exists today at all, that it didn't fall apart and blow away with the sands of time in those first 300 years, is a very clear testimony that the church is not an organization primarily. It is a living organism. It is alive and made alive by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit by the express decision of the sovereign heavenly Father. He wants the church to exist, so he makes it continue to survive. It's his church. He's not going to give up on it. But I'm going to run you through. Uh, there's, there's seven great councils. And because churches like to disagree about things, some churches agree with the first three. And the others, they say, didn't count. And others say, nope, there were four. And there's some that accept all seven. And oh, for crying out loud, you know how people are, right? But the first three, pretty much everybody agrees upon that are that are part of Jesus' one true church. The first one uh, happened in the year 325, and it's the Council of Nicaea. And it's an incredible year, 325, because in 325, the Roman Empire is doing its thing. It's moving and grooving and expanding and, you know, trying to wipe out everything else in the world. And there was an emperor by the name of Constantine. And Constantine is out on the battlefield one day, and he's ready to just go full Roman assault. And he sees a flaming cross in the sky. He'd heard about the Christians, but he wasn't one of them, and he wasn't real tolerant of them. But he sees a flaming cross in the sky. And he said, uh, I changed my mind. And that day, he testified that he came to faith in Jesus. And he said, well, if I'm the emperor of the world, today Christianity becomes the religion of the whole world, the whole Roman world. Is that good or bad? Yes. <laughs> uh, now, all of a sudden, Christians go from persecuted class to protected class. They go from hiding and, f and, and fighting for their existence to being given the weight of the Roman Empire. That's a good thing. 
The Roman Empire also had a developed road system and was developing educational systems. And now the gospel, is, the Romans who'd been, who'd been traveling those Roman roads to go and kill Christians now says, come on, we'll help you get the missionaries everywhere you want to go. But it also meant that the church got in bed with the government. Just so you know, that's never gone well for the church, ever. It's, it's almost always polluted the message. So that now all of a sudden, the Roman army is uh, not just protecting the church. It goes from persecuting to protecting to putting the sword tip at the throats of people and saying, you profess faith in Christ or we cut your heads off. Are those people real followers of Jesus? Maybe some of them did. Maybe some actually said, well, okay, and they, they met Jesus. But for the most part, then, we have this effect later on of just cultural Christian religion, nominal Christianity. So the uh, Roman thing, Constantine's uh, conversion, was it good or bad? It was good for Constantine. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Was it good for the church and the true gospel? Yes and no. But Constantine was the guy who, con who called for the Council of Nicaea. And they selected those, those great people from all over the world. And, and so they met together and uh, they said, the first thing that we really have to work on is answering the question, who is Jesus? And they answered the question, who is Jesus, at the Council of Nicaea by saying, Jesus wasn't just a man. And he wasn't a man adopted by God and given the spirit of sonship so that he became a God. They said Jesus was eternally coexistent with the Father. He is God, every, bat, every bit as much as God the Father. That's what the Council of Nicaea settled was Jesus is God. Okay? Then uh, the Council of Constantinople happened in 381, and there's this guy named... Um, uh, Apollinarius, and uh, Apollinarius was a guy who had who had uh, was a pretty convincing teacher and a kind of a charismatic guy, and he'd gotten quite a following. And he said, "Listen, Jesus had a physical human body, but on the inside, he was really a god. He was a god pretending to be a human. That makes Jesus not." the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. It makes Jesus a lying manipulator. You remember reading Greek and Roman mythology when you were a kid about how the gods were always messing around with and screwing with the humans and deceiving them? Apollinarius was turning Jesus into that. So the council wades in. Apollinarius says his speech, and they eventually pronounced him a heretic and said no Christians are to follow Apollinarius. But his... Uh, his error, his, his heresy, kept finding its way back into the church. Because remember, there's no mass communication. They can't send an email to the whole church and say, Apollinarianism is wrong and over. So there were still some corners of the kingdom in which people were still teaching that. So uh, later on, the, the Council of Ephesus in 431, there's another guy. His name's Nestorius. And Nestorius is a guy who, like Apollinarius, was really charismatic and, a, and an influential, influential teacher. And he said, uh, um, you know, Jesus was, was, uh, was God. He wasn't, he wasn't pretending to be a human. He was human, and he was God, but he was 50-50. He had a split personality. He was only half human, and he was only half God. That's significantly different than what the church really believes. The church doesn't say Jesus is half human because which half of human is missing? He's not half God and has half of the power of God. He is fully God and fully human. The math doesn't work very well, but Jesus isn't a mathematical equation. He is a being, the divine son of God. So they ruled out Nestorianism and said Jesus does not have a split personality. His humanness and his godhood are married up together in one nature. He doesn't have, he doesn't, he's not double-minded about anything. He doesn't have a, a divided heart about anything. Jesus is both divine and human wholly and completely. Council of Chalcedon, 20 years later in 451, said um, apparently a bunch of the people in the church didn't get the message of the Council of Ephesus because Nestorianism has whoosh, risen again 20 years later. So they ruled again. This is not true. Jesus isn't half and half. 
Jesus is authentically human and he is authentically God, holy and completely so. So they ruled on that issue again. Uh, the second council of Constantinople happened in 553. Guess what they were dealing with again? Nestorianism. And it's just one of, these, one of these errors and one of these lies that kept creeping back into the church. And eventually, all those things you'll find that, 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 that are lies about Jesus, they end up robbing him of his authority and power as God, and they rob him of his humanness by which he's able to represent us and really connect with us. If, if Jesus isn't the real Jesus, he doesn't matter at best because he's not God enough to save you and he's not human enough to know how to save you. So these errors about all this stuff we refer to as Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, Christo Logos, Christ words, okay? The, all of these councils were, were dealing, for the most part, with the issues of defining Christology. You've got to make sure you know who Jesus really is. Third Council of Constantinople happened from 680 to 681, and they were dealing with a, just another version of the, of the argument of the unity of Christ's person. Okay? And then uh, finally, the Second Council of Nicaea happened in 787, and it was a weird council. It was dealing with what we call iconoclasm where the church had really developed by the, by the year 8, 7, 800, had really developed into an ornate institution, and they had lots of symbols in the church, like a cross and maybe some paintings of great saints and so forth. And people were beginning, Christians were beginning to struggle with the issue of idolatry. They were worshiping these, these human beings, and they were worshiping sacred items and starting to treat them like they were... Um, like, like they were good luck charms or, or some, some, some object that was invested with divine power that if you could just touch it or get a piece of it, that you would have special powers from God. And so the, the, council, the second council of Nicaea, um, it probably did us some, some good and some harm when they said, get rid of all the symbols in the church. And so they start stripping everything other than the building itself. And the church went into a period where it lost some of the powerful symbols like the cross that have taught us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Well, what's interesting about all this is there's some, there's some argument and all of that, but the church just kept unifying. They kept doing whatever it would take. Get the leaders together again. Get on the horse for two more years. Pull them back together. Let's pull the church together. And so you will see that from the time of the church's birth in 29 AD up Till after the year 1000, for actually to the year 1054, you will see no significant splits in the church. Yes, there were occasionally groups that said, fine, we don't believe what you do. And they, went on, and they just blew away with the sands of time. They lasted about as long as their charismatic leaders. There were groups that the church looked at and said, you're going to come to order. You're going to submit to the authority of the church and its teachings, or you don't get to be a part of us anymore. And they put some groups out of the church. Guess what happened to those groups? They just evaporated over time. The church, for the most part, lived without significant division for over 1,000 years. That is the fingerprint of God. My, listen, the Purcell family... We can't, we can't do that for a thousand days. <laughs> you know how many divorces there are in my family? Literally more than there are marriages. Because, <laughs> you know, like my dad was divorced. I, don't, I, I lost track of how many times that guy. I mean, we just come apart at the seams all of the time. Humans just tear, uh, tear any organization apart. The church existed by the sustaining gathering grace of God for a thousand years before there was a significant split. That significant split, first great big one, happened in 1054 AD, and it's uh, what we call the Great Schism. And the church, mostly because of politics, a little bit because of belief, split as the Roman Empire was splitting, and uh, they ended up with two guys arguing over who got to be pope. And one of them was living in Constantinople, the eastern part of the, the empire, and one was living in Rome. And uh, there, was a, there was a fight between kings. There was also a fight between popes. 
And uh, so the Eastern Church went its way, and the Western Church went its way. And the Eastern Church be- became known as the Oriental Church, or the, which is a word that means Eastern, or Orthodox Church. So if you see the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, any of those Orthodox churches, they're Christians. But they're part of the Eastern Church, and we're going to leave them for now because our, our Nazarene roots go up through the western root of the tree, the western trunk of the tree, and the, or limb. And the western limb was known as the Roman Catholic Church because it was headquartered in Rome, and it was called Catholic because the word means universal. They said, we are the one world church, the one true church. And the Orthodox Church, that Orthodox word means um, right beliefs. They said, you know, we're the church with the right beliefs. <laughs> so the Eastern folks said, we're the true church. The Western ch- folks said, we're the true church. And Jesus was up there saying, I only have one church. You're both part of it. <laughs> Play nice. We're, we're still not playing real nice there. But um, we're going to follow the Western root of that thing, the Catholic church. And it li- lived for about another 500 years before there was another great splintering. And the great splintering that started taking place in the 1500s, there through 1650, had to take place. It's known as the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation of the church was a group of guys, beginning with Martin Luther, one of the, not not the very first reformer, but the most significant, who said, I'm looking at this Western church, and there are too many things corrupt and wrong about it. And they started protesting. That's where the word Protestant comes from. And the Catholic church said, thank you. We really appreciate that. No, they didn't. They said, get out of our church. And so they they chose to keep some of the corruption. And then the other folks who were kicked out of the church said, but I have to keep following Jesus. I don't know what to do, so I guess we'll start another church. So Luther started a church. You have any idea what it might be called? Lutheran, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, through the Protestant Reformation there, we've, so we've got the, East, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and then the Western Church starts to branch a little bit like a tree. We've got the Roman Catholic branch, and then we've got all these other littler branches over here. So some of the groups that split at that same time, you've got the Lutherans, you've got the whole um, German pietist groups like... Uh, um, uh, and the, um, the, the radical reformation of the, the Amish and the Mennonites and those folks, right? And that made its way, that whole reformation thing of, hey, let's fix the church, let's fix the church, let's fix this, the church, made its way up through Central Europe. And then there was kind of this pause, and the, the, the church took a breath, and then this reformation fire starts burning again in the British Isles. And in the British Isles, if you look um, there on the other side of the page, 1700s, it says First Great Awakening and Wesley. We're going to find that um, Wesley was in England, this guy named John Wesley. His dad was a pastor. Wesley, John himself, was brilliant. He was one of 21 children born to the same mom and dad. His dad was a really good pastor, meaning he was really faithful to teach the true gospel. And sometimes people aren't real fond of that. So they set the parsonage on fire. They, they tried to burn the house down. Maybe he, won't, uh, maybe he won't come back if we burn down his house. And uh, they rebuilt the house. And the next time they set the parsonage on fire with the family in it. And everybody got out except John, who was in the second story. And he was looking out the window and it looked like he was going to die. And they finally convinced him to jump. And his mom caught him, uh, Susanna. And she said, I knew in that moment that God had a special plan for this boy's life. He was like a brand plucked from the burning. And, and she said, you don't get to choose how to do life. God spared your life. You owe him your life. Dedicate your life to him. He took it very seriously. And he was watching all this, all this stuff that was happening in the, in the church in, uh, in the British Isles where pastorates were traded as favors. They were really good-paying jobs because they were paid by the crown, paid by the, by, the, by the government. And so there were people who were pastoring two or three different churches in two or three different towns and not even going and doing the work. And as John was was learning to read the scriptures, he said, I thought, I thought Christianity wasn't just this, this job. I thought it was supposed to change how you live toward people. So he goes to Oxford to study to become a pastor, and he and some other guys were of the same mind. We thought, we, we thought this was supposed to change us and make us like Jesus. So they, they found a great way to win friends and influence people and become really popular. They started this club called the Holy Club. That's a great way to get people to hate you. And it worked. Now, nobody at Oxford liked these guys, but they agreed that they would live um, 
kind of like a religious order in that they would have disciplines that they agreed upon, like rules in a club among them, that they would read the scriptures and pray daily, that they would worship God weekly, that they would meet together in a group to confess their sins to one another once a week, and after they confessed all the ways that they sinned against God, they would then go around the circle and they would confess all the ways they were tempted to sin but didn't so that their brothers and sisters would pray for them. And they started finding that their lives were significantly different than everybody else around them. And um, this thing kind of took root, but people started to kind of criticize John and the other guys. And they said, you think that you're going to become righteous by your methods? You know what they started calling those guys? The Methodists. Yeah, that's where the Methodist church came from. And Methodism swept all over the British Isles. And in about 100 years' time, it went from kind of the Oliver Twist kind of corruption and disease to the jewel of the earth and the, 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 the height of the British Empire. It was really incredible. The development of hospitals and public education and um, uh, child labor laws. And then it spread into the colonies. Wesley himself and his friends, George Whitfield, uh, came to the, to the colonies and started preaching. And there was this thing called the First Great Awakening, where all of a sudden, the colonists, who'd been pretty lax about the religious thing, it was like they suddenly woke up to Jesus again. And under the leadership of, of Whitfield, a little bit of Wesley, he ended up going back to England. And of a guy named Jonathan Edwards, who was a Puritan preacher. You may have, have read one of his sermons in your, your high school literature class called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, they, those guys led this great revival movement where God's Holy Spirit was just changing people, just changing people. It was happening back with Wesley in England. It was happening in the United States, too. Remember, this is before we've got mass communication. So a guy travels to the next town, and he's preaching the gospel, and great things happen in this town. And he gets on his horse, and he rides 100 miles the other direction. They have no idea what's happening in that other town, and it's happening over here. And it's spreading all across the frontier. Methodism is what really is. It was Methodist pastors and, uh, and groups that pushed the frontier all the way across to the western United States. And the uh, Catholics were coming from, they'd, they'd come up from Mexico and were pushing back, you know, toward, toward the east. But what pushed the frontier westward was, was Methodism. It was really kind of an interesting thing. But the Methodist church soon started cooling too. And they quit talking about this idea of how the gospel can change your life. It started to become just good, tame religion. Well, this, there was a guy among the Methodists who said, mm, I don't think so. And like John Wesley himself, he kind of caught fire by the Holy Spirit. And he said, you know, th this isn't just things that you believe and then you go to heaven, but you live like hell. He said, I think it's actually supposed to change you so that your heart is holy on the inside and what happens on the outside are righteous actions. You start living like Jesus. And the Methodist church said, thank you so much for showing us the error of our ways. No, they didn't. They kicked him out. But before they could kick him out, he, uh, he, he and some buddies started a, 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 a pastor's training school in Los Angeles. It is now called the University of Southern California. Yeah, USC started out as a, a preacher's college. And uh, the, chairman, the, or the, yeah, the chairman of the board was a guy named J.P. Whitney. Remember his name because uh, i got two minutes left to tell you about where the Nazarenes came from. It came from those guys who got kicked out of the Methodist church because they were continuing to preach this idea that your, your relationship with Jesus can be something more than a long list of apologies for all the ways that you sin. If you surrender your life to his Holy Spirit and you invite him to come in, he'll change you from the inside out. Don't you like the idea? I mean, I love a religion where you get to be forgiven, but there's something better than that. It's where you get to be changed, where you and Jesus can have a conversation that doesn't always begin with, I'm sorry I was unfaithful to you. How would your marriage be if every conversation started with, I cheated on you again? How would, how would your friendships be if, if every conversation began with, I shouldn't have punched you in the face again? You can move past that. 
You can move past that in your marriage. You can move past that in your friendships. And you can move past that in your relationship with the Lord by the power of his Holy Spirit. And the people who preached that got kicked out of the Methodist church. So they started planting churches. And one of the first things they did, they planted a church down in Southern California in uh, 1895 in the Azusa Street Mission where they're just feeding soup and doing things like they do in missions. And they called it the Church of the Nazarene. It was a guy named Phineas F. Brzee. And he saw the work down there was going well, and he said, I heard about this place called Washington. So he ran up here, and uh, the first thing he did is he went to Spokane, and he planted a church up there called First Church of the Nazarene. Still exists to this day. My buddy Bill pastors that church. And then he ran down to this little uh, town on the, uh, on the Palouse at Garfield, and he started planting a church there. And one year later, he wrote in his journal, these hard-headed German wheat farmers don't think they need each other, let alone God. I don't have time to waste on people like this. And he left. <laughs> and he went to Walla Walla, and he planted uh, First Church of the Nazarene there, which is now called Amazing Grace Church of the Nazarene. Then he ran right over here to Yakima, and he started Yakima First Church, which is now called Yakima New Hope Church of the Nazarene. And then... Um, by the way, the Church of the Nazarene as a denomination didn't exist yet, but he knew what was happening. So he came up here, he plants all these churches for a few years, and then he organizes them as this thing called the Northwest District. He said, I'll be back. <laughs> Takes off back to Southern California. Um, and it, by the way, if you study the history of the Assemblies of God, you're going to read about some of the same people in some of the same places, because we started together in the Azusa Street Mission there in the Los Angeles area. They're our brothers and sisters, for sure, because they too believe that if God's Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, he's going to change you. He's going to give you power to live very differently. Well, this same message was also, um, it's not Brzee's baby. It's the Holy Spirit's baby. And so there were some groups in the northeastern part of the United States up in New England, in New York, in Massachusetts. There were some groups in, uh, in Tennessee, um, some throughout the Deep South, a, a handful of them in, in uh, Texas, some others um, uh, in Chicago. And they start hearing about one another. And so there's these individual churches, and they're forming these holiness, these regional holiness associations, this idea that God can change your heart, and if he changes your heart, it'll change your actions. And once the holiness associations started hearing about each other, they started organizing together in these kind of loose confederations, and this is happening all over the country by God's Holy Spirit. It's really an incredible thing. And it, it spawned what we call the American Revivalist Movement. And these, they started pooling their resources and finding people who are really good at preaching the gospel, and they're sending them out. And they're saying, you go from town to town to town. We will pay you to go. And you go in Jesus' name, and you preach. And revivalism swept all across America. And it gave birth to a number of denominations, and one of them was the Church of the Nazarene. And so a bunch of these organizations, they got together in Chicago in um, 1907, and they joined together in a group that they called the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. But over the course of the next year, a bunch of the other uh, holiness associations found out what they had done, and we didn't know there were a bunch of them in Texas. And so a bunch of them said, we want in. So the next year, we went down to Pilot Point, Texas in 1908 and pulled all those folks in, and they said, let's just keep the same name. They called it the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. When did the Church of the Nazarene begin? Doesn't matter. Uh, some say 1895 with that group down in, uh, in Los Angeles. Some say when they became a denomination in Chicago in 1907. And the, the guys who get to be in control of things will tell you 1908 is the year in Pilot Point, Texas. It was in October of that year. Notice Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene because that word Pentecostal meant this. It meant that like the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came and changed a bunch of knucklehead fishermen who were scared of their own shadows into the courageous warriors for Jesus in this world, people who, were, who had like, like God-level love for other humans and for Jesus, and they spread out into the world all over there in, in Israel. Yeah, that's what the word Pentecostal meant. You had that fire from God's Holy Spirit. And so we called ourselves the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. But over the course of the next 10 years or so, that name, some folks, uh, the, other, the other folks, uh, the Assemblies of God grew a lot faster and more popularly than we did. And they, they were using the word Pentecostal as well. And, and the, you probably know about the Assemblies of God that they say, when God's Holy Spirit comes to live in you, the chief sign of that is that you will speak in tongues. 
And so it had just become common across the United States that the, if you were Pentecostal, that you were a person who spoke in tongues. Nazarenes aren't against it. We just don't, we don't, we don't teach it and we don't practice it in our public worship services because the scriptures tell us not to. So we decided it wasn't a protest. It was just saying this no longer describes who we are. So in 1919, we let go of that uh, word Pentecostal, and we just became the Church of the Nazarene. If you look right across the page, 1908 to 1988, holy cow, other groups started finding out about the Church of the Nazarene. So there's this gospel workers union in Canada that brought 5,000 and decided to join us. And there was a, uh, some, some folks in Scotland that said, yeah, we want to be a part of that and, and all over the place. My favorite story is from my senior year in high school, 1988. 1988, there's this group from Uganda called the Ugandan Church of the Nazarene. And they said, there's another Church of the Nazarene? And they, they called our headquarters in Kansas City. And they said, tell us about this Church of the Nazarene. They said, well, we believe this, this, and this. They said, we believe those exact same things. They said, well, we're organized like this. We have, we have districts, and we have, we have pastors, and we have district superintendents. We have they said, we, we are literally organized exactly the same way. And we have a book that we call the manual that, that we just kind of run our church by. Here's what's happened. Some, some Nazarene businessman or missionary, we don't know, was traveling to Uganda, had the manual of the Church of the Nazarene left at a hotel somewhere, and some little cleaning lady picked that thing up and said, I recognize the fire of God's Holy Spirit among these people. And the, the Ugandan Church of the Nazarene joined us with like 6,000 people all at once. And now you're going to see that in the, in the United States, the Church of the Nazarene is, is pretty stable and shrinking a little bit like most churches everywhere else in the world. Get out of the way! Because we are winning, we winning people to Jesus and planting churches so fast, we literally don't know how many we have. We don't know. Uh, in, I, I have a friend who's a missionary in the South Pacific. He said, forget it. I don't have any idea how many we have. He said, I just know this. If you'd give me a trained pastor, I could plant a church every day for the rest of my life. In uh, the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia and that country, forget it. Forget trying to put a lid on the thing. Uh, in, Ten years ago, in one year, the east, uh, the, 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 the south central district, just one district of Ethiopia, planted 1,500 new churches of the Nazarene. That year, they had a church planting conference that all the pastors on the district were required to attend. A bunch of them had to walk for days to get there. This one pastor gets there three days late, and the, the district superintendent, when he walks in, I mean, just, you know, Africa's a different place, and he just calls him down in front of everybody else. Brother, you were supposed to be here three days ago. We made it abundantly clear, and you're showing disrespect. And he said, I'm sorry, I planted three churches on the way here. <laughs> I mean, the, it's just <clears throat> like this all the way around the world. So know this, and I'm done. You are a part of something that is much bigger in Grandview Church of the Nazarene. Those flags you see hanging on the wall and that map that you see over there, 169, I think it is, world areas today, we're in places where it's illegal for us to go. And everywhere that, that we seem to go, God is adding his blessing. All those, those offerings that you give, a portion of those go to the World Evangelism Fund. And we're seeing to, we, this church, this church, the last, the last tithe that you gave, the last offering that you gave made it possible for somebody to hear the gospel somewhere else in the world. We're, um, we're introducing to, we have a problem on our hands. We're introducing people to Jesus so fast that we can't prepare pastors fast enough to go take care of the churches. So, if you want to be part of a church like that, you're in the right place. If you're going to be a part of a church like that, I would ask you would, you, would you do what Jesus said? He looked at the disciples, and he said, when people figure out what the church is, they're going to come running. So he said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the harvest. Here's what I wanted to ask you to pray. If in any way you consider Grandview Nazarene your church, pray that the Lord will start calling our young people to ministry. Because the churches need pastors. And we're at a spot where if we win all these people to Jesus, but we don't give somebody to lead them, 
they'll end up being led astray. We have a problem on our hands. It's not one that can't be solved because God the Holy Spirit already wants to do it. That's the history lesson. That's where the Church of the Nazarene came from. hundred years ago this year, somebody in Grandview dreamed that there'd be a church. I'm going to have to somehow find a way to get to the party for the centennial here and run over to Lewiston, Idaho, where I just moved from, where they're having their 100th anniversary as well. Both these churches uh, 100 years ago today. I'm glad to be a part of the Church of the Nazarene. It's pretty awesome. And if it dries up and blows away tomorrow, I'm still a Christian and they'll take me somewhere. Lord, thanks for our time together tonight. Thanks for the Church of the Nazarene and uh, for all of your church. Lord, we just want to be a true part of your church. What you're doing in this world, we just want a part of it. We don't deserve it. It's only by your grace. But boy, you seem to love giving grace. So I pray that you'd give us the grace to continue to be a part of a church that is uh, walking by the power of your spirit and being used by you for your glory and for your mission in this world. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, I took nine extra minutes of your time. I'm sorry about that, but I did cover 2,025 years, okay? (laughs) Thanks, friends.